James Wand is here in Berlin, Germany, Berlin, Deutschland. And this is a really great representative shot of the Wernstern. And this is from the Park Inn, once known as a Stadt Hotel, built in 1970. And this was built for the Comic Con, uh, which was an association of uh, the communist uh, trading partners. And it was really that elite group that could stay here. Now, uh, this is 2016, obviously, and uh, it's free for anyone to stay here. Actually, not free, but anyone can stay here as long as they have enough uh, euros to stay here. It's not that expensive, but uh, it is a really interesting hotel that it still feels like it's the Stadt Hotel. So it hasn't changed in terms of the interior or the exterior, but uh, it's a really great view. And the Fernsehturm was built in 1969, completed in 1969. It is uh, approximately 1,207 feet high or 367 meters looking towards the west. And uh, for me, I thought it was really important to do this video because I love Berlin. It is a very enigmatic city. A lot of people said, oh, the people aren't very nice here, so you're going to have to watch out for that. I didn't really experience that or find that to be the case. I actually found people to be very nice and welcoming. And um, it's a very different city that, than I expected. It's a much uh, flatter city. It's much more of an expansive. And uh, though the public transport system is really good, it takes a little longer to, to get around than one might think. But I love the journey here. I love the architecture, the art, the um, uh, even the details at the museums were fantastic. And see the architecture and the history, I kept wondering. And I also think people, my fellow visitors, and perhaps people who still live there today think of Berlin in terms of what was East and what was West. It's a remarkable place in history and the 20th century is really the bulk of this and uh, that'll be the talk here today. East and West Berlin, West um, Berlin, West Germany, East Germany, the flags are nearly identical. Uh, so the top portion is the East Berlin flag, the East German flag. So in 1949 to 1959 these flags from East to West were identical but to make a distinction point the East wanted to make sure that it highlighted itself as being a different nation state than that of West Germany. And you're gonna see here is the garland of corn, the compass, and the hammer, which is uh, very emblematic of a communist um, stylization. Etymology is not known, but the folk etymology says that it is stemming from the word the German word bear, and meaning bear, and the symbol of the city is the bear itself. Archaeological evidence points to wooden houses built in 1174 as the first settlements that became Berlin. Berlin is first mentioned in text in 1237. St. Nikolai Church is constructed in 1243. The first Berliner Schloss is constructed in 1443 and again here in about uh, 2012. It's a center for the Prussian Empire, Enlightenment, Expressionism, National Socialism, Communism, and Capitalism. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the bulk of the talk of the 20th century. And why the 20th century? Well, because it's one of the most compelling and interesting um, and most, um, I would say, the most activities that have happened in one particular 100-year period is the 20th century. From 1914 to 1918 is uh, World War I, and uh, it was at Germany's loss. And Kaiser Wilhelm II had to abolish monarchy and left for the Netherlands. Between 1919 and 1913, you have the Weimar Republic comes into existence. It really has a long debt of um, debts due to um, its neighbors that it was at war with and uh, had severe inflation and unfortunately was really one of the reasons that the Nazi uh, party came into play, the National Socialism Party, between 33 and 45. In 1938, Kristallnacht happens and this is the, the marking of uh, the Jewish pogrom and uh, Jews end up in concentration camps. Tonight of Broken Glass is really the uh, translation and uh, a lot of uh, death and destruction. It was a terrible, terrible event. And World War II starts in 1940, ends in 1945. At the end of World War II, Berlin is divided into four sectors, the American, the British, the French, and the Soviet. And in 1948, you have the Berlin airlift between 45 and 48, I might add during this period of time. This is a really breakdown between what were former allies of the Soviet Union to the Western, uh, former Western allies, and really begins the Cold War. Blockade begins, and the airlift is something that happens between 1948 and 1949. In that year, 1949, you find uh, East Germany comes into existence 
actually it's West Germany first and then East Germany. Uh, Bonn is its capital for West Germany and East Berlin is for East Germany. In 1953, the June 13th uprising happens, and it's one moment that is quelled by uh, considerable armed forces on the East German side, but it was one awakening call to the East German government to pay attention to its population. In 1961, uh, the Berlin Wall is constructed, completely a surprise to most people, and uh, in 1969, in the mid-60s, is this plan to rejuvenate what is called the Alexanderplatz and the Mitte and uh, the Wesentum is the big TV tower you saw in the very beginning and that's completed in 1969. In 1976 the uh, East German government finally decides to have a parliament building and in it is a uh, Volkskammer and a few other uh, uh, unique features to this building. It was a building that was not just for uh, the parliament, it was really for other things as well such as a bowling alley and theaters and, and 13 restaurants, you know, quite a facility. And in 1989, the Berlin Wall falls, and German reunification happens on October 3rd of 1990. Some factoids of Berlin. The largest population was about 70 years ago with 4.3 million people, and uh, that is uh, 3.6 million in 2016 terms. Uh, Berlin has one international airport uh, that goes not just from uh, locations in Europe but abroad, and that is the Tegel Airport. One low-cost airport, which was in the former East Berlin, called Schonenfeld. One closed airport, built by the Nazis, called Tempelhof. And Tempelhof, by the way, is one of the largest buildings in the world even today. One airport is uh, built, it's called Berlin-Brandenburg, and that was started in 2006, technically ready by 2011, but four major delays later, and it's still not scheduled to open until 2018, and uh, there's some speculation that it may never open. There are 19 traditional gates that dot the city, the traditional uh, Berlin landscape, the Brandenburg Tor and the Frankfurter Tor. Brandenburg is on the west, Frankfurter is on the east of Berlin. I was in awe of Berlin. There's no city like it. There's no major city with so many changes in uh, circumstances. It was a divided city and there's no other city quite like that in Western European history. Now, Berlin has been a divided city for four decades in the 20th century. And again, this is pointing to something that's so uniquely different that other European cities have not had to face this. Berlin was once a rival to Paris. Now it is the third largest city in Europe after London and Madrid, and it is the poorest uh, major city in Germany. No other city has come under the flags of three other European nations as well as the United States. And I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, this is a talk about the 20th century. But these are the old gates and uh, Brandenburg, the most famous, uh, Brandenburg Tor, Potsdamer Tor, as well as Frankfurter Tor. And uh, just a snapshot in the back is 1688 to 1836. Not a lot of activity. And this is primarily the, the River Spree and uh, the Mitte is right here. And again, in 1836, uh, 150 years later, it really hasn't changed all that much. But you find that something happens, uh, you know, in 1911. Uh, turn of the century is that Berlin has grown considerably. There are many sides and histories to Berlin, but I wanted to show you something interesting. In this red zone here is um, a street called the Karl Liebknechtstrasse. It's really had about seven different names. It is east of the Unterter Linden. It is uh, bordering the north portion of Alexanderplatz. And uh, just showing this history is fascinating. So in 1969, it was renamed Karl Liebknechtstrasse and that's after the founder of the German Communist Party. Uh, Co-founder was Karl Liebeknecht as well as Rosa Luxemburg. And even today, 2016, it's still named after the Communist uh, German uh, co-founder of the party. And uh, East and West Berlin begin through three significant events, the London Protocol, the Yalta Conference, and the Potsdam Conference and uh, culminate in the end of World War II on 2nd of September 1945. Now, Berlin is uh, created in terms of East versus West Berlin, in terms of looking at, um, you know, the end of World War II, the defeat of the Third Reich, and, um, you know, no one could have predicted what would have happened in the next four decades. And uh, because of those particular uh, protocols or meetings, uh, East and West Berlin did come into existence in 1945. And uh, the zones are broken up into the French, British, American, and the Soviet. Though it was divided into four zones, the city was unified with one mayor, 
uh, post office, one administration, one electrical system, as well as one public transport system. Things did begin to break down uh, between the Allied administration and uh, the blockade begins of Berlin in 24 June 1948, culminating in 12 May 1949. What was suspended and what was blockaded was water, rail, and automobile routes from West Germany to West Berlin, and only air routes were available to Berlin. The blockade consisted of 300,000 flights and uh, 300,000 uh, airplane operations, which meant uh, an airplane landing or departing every 30 seconds. Berlin's Tegel Airport, which is still in existence today, was uh, constructed in 1948 and took 90 days to create and it was uh, worked on around the clock. West Germany, again, as I mentioned earlier, was founded in 23 May 1949 um, first and then secondarily was East Germany, founded in 7 October 1949. And uh, East uh, Berlin and Germany face a massive brain drain, so lawyers, doctors, um, uh, scientists, engineers go from the East to the West. And uh, that was about 3.5 million people. In that, uh, uh, in the timeline, was a uh, Volksaufstand in the DDR, which is an uprising of construction workers. The chairman of the SED party and GDR uh, state council chair is Walter Ulbricht, and in 15 June 1961, he said, "Niemand hat der Absicht, eine Mauer zu errichten." And uh, really, this is the first time that the wall has ever been mentioned. Yet, yeah, it was never. Uh, created at this point. It was until August of this year, August 13. Eric Honecker would become a future chair of the SED as well as the state council, and he was a prime organizer of the wall. In 13 August 1961, to many people's surprise, the wall construction begins. The city is completely encircled by the East German forces. The wall. Now the wall was a significant barrier, obviously, um, meant to deter people from going to the west. And you can see the wall here, I'm trying to trace the wall in the western portion. And uh, it's a very fascinating experience here uh, in terms of um, these particular points. I'll tell you about that in a moment. So between here and here is 43.1 kilometers. And uh, so this portion here is 111 kilometers facing into East Germany from West Berlin. And the total um, uh, wall is uh, 155 kilometers. There are 302 uh, watch uh, guard towers, 14,000 guards continuously guarding around the clock, 259 dog runs, 20 bunkers. There are 239 escapees who are killed, 260 are wounded, 5,043 escapees, including 574 soldiers. In the east, the wall was known as the anti-fascist protective wall. There are 15 checkpoints. So each of the checkpoints were mainly for the uh, German citizens on either side. And there were two um, checkpoints only for foreigners. That is the checkpoint Charlie on Frederikstrasse, it's right here, and checkpoint Bravo in the southwest portion of Berlin. And uh, you could also get through here, which is a Waltersdorf, but only go to the um, Schonenfeld Airport, which is right here. There was a fourth possibility of going to Frederikstrasse. Even though the Cold War was happening, you could still take a train into this particular area, into East Germany. Uh, there are 12,000 Allied forces in this area, and there are half a million troops on the East German side. So you could have American, French, or British forces who could enter into East Berlin uh, in terms of the Checkpoint Charlie and uh, would have to leave their weaponry behind, but could come. Uh, but also had to be in their armed uh, forces um, uniforms. The wall itself. It had basically four different uh, upgrades, and I just want to share with you this experience here. So you have the watchtowers, you have a fence, basically a, a mesh wire fence on the East German side, and uh, you have still stakes planted, acoustic cables if they were tripped. Um, uh, this would alert the towers here of somebody trying to escape. Bunkers um, were posted on the ground here, dog runs. Uh, armed patrols, there were ditches in many places. And uh, street lamps, so it was very bright at nighttime, like daytime in uh, nighttime. Um, control strips, they were sanded and uh, combed through every day to see any footprints. Here's what the West saw, which was the true um, Berlin Wall. Technically, on this side right here, 
on the western portion. This is also East Germany for about a meter or so. So guards could come out only two at a time and uh, one to make sure the other didn't escape. But that was to check on the wall, the integrity of the wall. The four upgrades to the wall begin in 1961, the wire fence and concrete block walls, improved wire fence 1962 to 65, and 65 to 75 is the improved concrete wall right here. And the Grenzmauer 25, or the border wall 75, and uh, the wall segment was increased to 3.8 meters right here, and also this round tube, which is made of asbestos, was created as well. And the theory behind that was it was difficult to uh, you know catch on to that to move over the wall. The fall of the wall that happens in 9 November 1989. So this uh, Velvet Revolution uh, eventually hits into East Germany as well, and uh, East and West Germany are unified on 3 October 1990. But what I find very fascinating, and also there's 221 meters. Uh, 725 feet of the wall still existing today. Here is this white section, this is West Berlin, and uh, this yellow section right here is East Berlin. Now this is 2016, so the effects are still with us today. Unintended consequences sometimes live on for a very long time. You see a picture here of Robert F. Kennedy looking into uh, Berlin, as well as his brother in 1961 looking over into the Brandenburg Gate, and if you wonder what the sign is, these Germans are complaining that the Yalta, the Potsdam, and the London Protocol were not being abided by. Very famous picture here of Getty Images, and uh, you know this is one I wish I could have been in Berlin even before the wall fell, and uh, this is where uh, East German troops are coming over to their counterparts, uh, the West German police. So here you see East German troops, who are the only ones that could be on top of the wall. The West German uh, police forces could only be on the side of the wall. And here's what it looks like today. Uh, I wanted to really point out and highlight this building. Complex Berlin is the slide title. Uh, Palace de la Republic was completed in 76, sees 14 years of use, uh, demolished in 2005. I think it's a, an amazing mid-century modern architecture, and the architects are Heinz Graf und and Karl Ernst Vora. Uh, the Volkskammer, which is a parliament building, is here, the large auditorium, 13 restaurants, a bowling alley, post office, discotheque, and a theater are located here. Now, uh, this is a very interesting building because it was built on top of the uh, Berliner Schloss uh, from 1451, demolished in 1950. The reason it was demolished was uh, it was considered uh, a not in good taste in East German fashion to build uh, an imperial palace. And so the decision, and there's a long span of time between 1950 and approximately 1974 is when the Palace de la Republic was, uh, construction began and the building was finished itself. And uh, interestingly enough, as Berlin couldn't get more complex, it does, uh, the basement of the Palace was left intact and the uh, new uh, Schloss is being built on top of it. That should be completed in the next uh, year or two. Uh, Berlin today, modern, thriving, beautiful city. Uh, some people think it's gritty, but I don't really think it is. It's uh, a handsome city, a beautiful city. Uh, the Brandenburg Gate here, the Reichstag. Uh, definitely visit the Reichstag. You do need an invitation, and you can do so online to apply for it. Here is the Mitte and the Fesentum right here. And uh, these are, you know, the signifiers that uh, Berlin is... Um, you know, the most iconic parts are still the uh, East German um, portions created by the communists. You can see here is uh, Potsdamer Platz, very modern building. Uh, again, John F. Kennedy, JF, um, this is a restaurant. Uh, there's a museum called the Kennedys. Uh, John F. Kennedy is still revered in Berlin today. And here you're going to see a, a really cool architecture here. Uh, it's called the House de Lairs, and this is for the uh, in honor of the teachers, a lot of Plattenbau architecture. Plattenbau refers to concrete um, pieces that were put together to create these apartment buildings. This is called Karl Marx Allee. Even today in 2016, this is where the East Germans held their military parades. It is considered uh, a grand, uh, one of Europe's grandest uh, streets. And in the middle here is a beautiful water fountain. Uh, I do love this architecture. It is, uh, in my opinion, somewhat under-recognized and underappreciated, uh, but somehow it just seemed to work really well. Uh, some very talented architects worked on this portion of East Germany, East Berlin. 
Berlin today, the Altus Museum, a uh, showpiece restored and absolutely pristine and beautiful. So here's the Aquadome inside the Radisson Blue Hotel. And uh, this um, diver is cleaning uh, the aquarium every, I think every other day or so. It's about seven stories high until you can actually take an elevator or lift right through here. It costs about 15 euros. Uh, Berlin today again is, I saw these in, near the um, Checkpoint Charlie, and I think that's a really cool sign, Hope Hope. Uh, this is a um, Artes Nacional Galeria. This is the interior of the Reichstom by Lord Norman Foster. A uh, fantastic place to visit, you have to visit. But be sure to get an appointment and uh, do so online. Here is the uh, St. Mary's Church, and uh, behind it is the iconic Versenturm. Uh, this is a recreated sign about uh, Checkpoint Charlie. You're leaving the American sector. Vous sortez de secteur américain, and in German, Z verlassen den amerikanischen sector. And uh, this is uh, in closing, uh, just a beautiful structure. This is um, would have been in the West um, German portion of uh, Berlin, and it's fascinating. It was um, conceived in 1989 wasn't completed until 1999, and it's a city um, that really has amazing architecture. Now, the curious thing about this building is completely empty. You see some lights on here, but it is uh, not in use at this point. Now, this is a very nice reference to mid-century modern architecture uh, with a modern twist, these really beautiful pink uh, light panels. So the panels are to keep in the temperatures in the cooler parts of the year or to shade in from the heat of the summer. It is a fascinating city with just so much to see and do and one where I'm going to do more videos on this uh, experience. It is fantastically, uh, you know, fun city, friendly city, easy to get around. I didn't think it was terribly expensive. The Berlin Pass is a great way to see the city. It's only 25 euros. I'll put more information down below. Thank you so much for watching this today. I really appreciate it. Salute and Prost.